welcome. In this vlog, I am going to explain through what I observe and from what I experience why the family court is so terrifying. This is a very dark vlog and for good reason. It is going to once and for all expose a family court in a way that I don't believe has ever been done before. I am going to dive straight into it, but before I do, I must run my excellent introduction. I am Philip Kedge, a retired police chief inspector and director of the Mackenzie Friends UK network. I have been a Mackenzie Friend assisting people through the family court as a layperson for over a decade. In all my vlogs, my views and opinions are entirely my own. Please help me by liking, sharing, subscribing and hitting that notification bell. Ladies and gentlemen, the most terrifying aspect of the family court system is that I, Philip Kedge, as a vastly experienced Mackenzie friend, believe that I have the knowledge and understanding if I chose to use it to assist hateful, vengeful and spiteful resident parents to manipulate the family court system in order to reduce, minimise, restrict or deny contact between the non-resident parents and their children and potentially to destroy that relationship for months and months on end and in some cases even permanently. It is a blueprint on how resident parents who are mostly mothers can manipulate the family court against the non-resident parents who are mostly fathers. I call it the blueprint of hate, where if I had no morals or integrity and didn't care about the welfare of any child, I could use over and over again, with a high rate of success for my own significant financial gain. In this vlog, I am going to explain that blueprint, but I want to make a couple of points very clear. I am not telling you what to do in your family court case. I am not encouraging people to manipulate the family court system. I am just sharing with you what I see from my own personal perspective. And if this vlog resonates with you, to reach out to you and to invite you to contact me at contactphil.co.uk. I also want to make it absolutely clear. I am not talking about the real victims of domestic abuse, which we all as reasonable people understand. I'm talking about the resident parents, mostly mothers, who are making spurious allegations based on hate to manipulate the family court and child contact. What I mean by spurious allegations are those that are based on simply dragging up every unfortunate, perhaps unsavoury, possibly hurtful, even potentially unacceptable, but perhaps understandable, family incidents over the duration of a relationship. The incidents that may happen in most relationships as people navigate through the ups and downs and pressures of life. These incidents which are then twisted and exaggerated into an alternative truth and then presented as significant incidents of abuse and a relationship characterised by coercive control. Spurious allegations motivated by spite, hate, hurt feelings, revenge, irrational anxieties and unfettered emotions to reduce, minimise, restrict or deny child contact with the non-resident parent. In my mind, it is these resident parents who are undermining, devaluing and eroding the real serious issues around domestic abuse and whilst doing so are themselves the ones causing significant harm to their own children and destroying their childhoods, which the family court appears to be blind to and seemingly powerless to prevent. 
As I take you through this blueprint of hate, consider this. If you believe that I can manipulate the family court, what do you think family lawyers may be doing in every family court for their financial gain? Let's start to expose the blueprint of hate. But for clarity, I will be referring to the resident parent as the mother and the non-resident parent as the father, because that is statistically accurate. And I don't do wokeness or political correctness. Chapter one. The mother must stop child contact. This is often falsely legitimised by the mother contacting child services by telephone with concerns about the other parent. You don't even need any detail. Child services will respond to say that any parent with parental responsibility has a duty to keep the children safe. That can now be conveniently twisted to mean I was told by child services to stop contact. The mother's solicitor will happily write a letter to the father telling him that due to safeguarding concerns, contact has now been stopped. Stopping the contact is absolutely crucial at the start of the blueprint of hate because that sets the status quo moving forward. You see, a court is very unlikely to order direct contact between a child and the father when contact has been stopped and safeguarding issues have been raised and remain unresolved. Chapter two, to decline mediation. Let's now assume that the father, after three months of not seeing his children, tries to restore contact with mediation and attends a MIAM, the Mediation Information and Assessment Meeting. Of course, the blueprint of hate provides clarity to this situation. The mother should string this out as long as they can with her solicitor sending letters back and forth as all delays provide more time to set the status quo of no contact. However, when things eventually come to a head, the mother simply raises an exemption to mediation based on domestic abuse and coercive control. The father, now out of all options, submits his child arrangements application in the naive belief that the family court will see through the nonsense and will quickly restore contact. Well, the blueprint of hate will ensure that that doesn't happen. Chapter three, responding to the application with the form C1A. The mother on receiving a copy of the application and the date for the first hearing in six to eight weeks time, responds by submitting a C1A to record her allegations of harm and domestic abuse. The mother lists all the spurious allegations against the father that she can muster, trying to link them all together to represent coercive control and prioritising any incident occurring in the presence of the children. Remember, it's the mother's interpretation of events, her perceptions and feelings, her truth, based on her motivations. How far that may be twisted from reality, no one will ever know. Chapter 4. The Kafka Safeguarding Call and Letter. This interview is open to manipulation under the blueprint of hate. The mother doubles down on her safeguarding concerns, the spurious allegations based around her truth, coupled with the fact that the children are scared and fearful of the father, that they don't want to see him until it is safe to do so that she is fearful and anxious and that the father is manipulative and controlling. 
Kafka sends speak to the father, he denies it all, and may even try and use the forbidden words of parental alienation that Kafka simply ignore. The safeguarding letter will reflect the high levels of hostility between the parents, but the holy grail under the blueprint of hate is to ensure that the Kafka family court advisor concludes with the magic words that the court needs to consider whether a fact-finding is necessary based on the mother's allegations and until then direct contact remains unsafe and cannot be recommended. With that in place it is all going perfectly to plan. Chapter 5 the first hearing dispute resolution appointment. By the time of the first hearing, the father has not seen the child for five months since separation. The objective under the blueprint of hate is to now manipulate the court to achieve two outcomes. Firstly, that more information and evidence is needed before the court can consider whether a fact-finding is needed or not. Secondly, to conclude that direct contact is still not safe until all the information can be assessed. Well, both these outcomes are pretty much already in the bag in order to make considerations under Practice Directions 12J for a fact-finding hearing, the court needs all the information to be available. The mother's job under the blueprint of hate is to simply continue to present a total brick wall in refusing to agree direct contact. The Kafka safeguarding letter clearly states that direct contact is not recommended and nothing has changed. And how about this? The judge is totally limited in ordering the progression of contact at direction hearings where there is no consent by the mother. Contact can only be ordered without consent following contested adversarial hearings where evidence is heard. The judge's hands are now totally tied with the implementation of the powerful blueprint of hate. The mother with her sick lawyer are now in total control of both the judge and the court process. I warned you that this was terrifying. As predicted, the judge orders the mother to complete a Scott schedule of allegations along with a supporting statement. The father is to respond to her statement. The next hearing is a case management hearing to review the mother's statement of allegations and the father's response. It is listed for three to four months time, still with no direct contact during this period. Chapter 6. The Statement of Hate. The mother now writes her schedule of allegations and her statement of hate. Signed, of course, with a statement of truth, her truth. And who can predict the creativity of a mother hell bent on throwing her ex under the family court bus to restrict, minimise, reduce or deny contact with her children? Supported, of course, by a family lawyer who will advocate for her truth with no professional duty of care to any child, all too often stirring the pot of hate for their own financial gain. At this stage, there is only one objective within the blueprint of hate, to throw as much mud as possible so that some of it will stick, and to ensure that there are sufficient triggers and sound bites of abuse and coercive control so that when Practice Directions 12J is applied, the judge will be manipulated into believing that there is a necessity for a fact-finding hearing. You see, everything is starting to stack up against the father, and the blueprint of hate also takes advantage of the following potential factors. Firstly, 
The next hearing will most likely be listed for only one hour. In reality, there is no way that allegations can be appropriately considered in that time. Secondly, judges are mostly risk adverse, where holding a fact finding based on spurious allegations is a safer option than having to make bold and pragmatic decisions that they fear may be criticised if they get wrong. Thirdly, if the father denies the allegations in his response, then the argument is that because the father is in denial and won't accept the responsibility for his behaviour, he is now a greater threat to the children, making the fact-finding hearing even more necessary. Lastly, and this is brilliant, if a judge is ever brave enough to throw out spurious allegations based on hate, the mother, on the advice of her lawyer, simply appeals that decision. She has absolutely nothing to lose. An appeal could place the entire proceedings on hold potentially for months, with still no direct contact for the father. Indeed, a judge throwing out the allegations and the mother appealing could perversely be the worst case scenario for the father. How ridiculously insane is that? Chapter 7. The Case Management Hearing. So, at the time of the case management hearing, the father has not had direct contact for eight to nine months. Let that thought settle for a moment. No contact for eight to nine months, and we have hardly even started. For the reasons already stated in the last chapter, the risk adverse judge under significant time pressures predictably takes a path of least resistance and orders a fact-finding hearing in three to four months time. Until then, the mother continues to resist any progression to direct contact with her lawyer citing that it would be unsafe to do so until any fact-finding hearing and that nothing has changed since the Kafka's original safeguarding letter. Again, the judge is totally impotent in being able to increase contact. That's the immense power of the blueprint of hate. The mother and her lawyer remain totally in control and are playing the family court exactly how they want to. They even hold the final card. If the judge tries to impose the progression of contact, they simply appeal that decision, causing more delays, which is to their advantage. Chapter 8 the fact-finding hearing. It has been over 12 months since the father has had any direct contact with his children. The odds of the father coming out of the fact-finding hearing unscathed is very low. Why? Because the mother has presented so many spurious allegations that some of them will stick and the father also has the madness of the totally ill-conceived Domestic Abuse Act of 2021 to contend with. It only takes findings on a couple of issues and the father could be labelled as a domestic abuser or child abuser for life. Let me give you this fictional example. The mother claims that three years ago there was a physical altercation in the bedroom. The father pushes her onto the bed, sits on her and pushes her into the bed with his hand on her neck. He only stops because the oldest child hears the struggle and enters the room, witnessing the incident. The father's account is that he was already lying on the bed. The mother, in a fit of rage, jumps on him and tries to scratch his face. He places his hand upwards on her neck to keep her away from his face and pushes her off the bed. The oldest child comes into the room and the mother runs to the child stating, Daddy attacked me. 
The truth lies nowhere. There is no evidence, but the judge, with the standard of balance of probability, makes a finding simply on whose account they believe. And of course, the safest path of no resistance is to believe the mother. That can be repeated over and over again with a number of allegations. The father is now labelled as a violent domestic abuser, a label that will last and be used against him forever. Chapter 9. The Progression of Contact after the fact-finding, the judge is now for the first time able to make considerations around interim contact as evidence has now been heard. However, the blueprint of hate remains a very powerful and potent weapon. The mother's solicitor now demands that because some findings of abuse, indeed violent domestic abuse, has been found, the matter should be referred to CAFCAS to do a Section 7 report. The judge agrees that a CAFCAS Section 7 report would be helpful, but questions why contact cannot be progressed to at least direct supervised contact in a contact centre. Why would that not be safe? The blueprint of hate has the answer. The lawyer reminds the judge that the children have not seen the father for over a year. Any progression of contact has to be done slowly and carefully at their pace, with the oversight and recommendations of Kafkas as to the best way forward. The blueprint of hate is too powerful for the judge, and the judge concedes that point and orders a Section 7 report to determine the wishes and feelings of the children. Any safeguarding measures based on findings of domestic abuse and what the progression of contact should look like. The next hearing will be a directions hearing in three to four months time, by which time the father would have had no direct contact with the children for 16 months. Chapter 10. The End Game. Ladies and gentlemen, the end game can now have many different scenarios. The children may be totally adverse to seeing their father and direct contact is never restored. The father may only get as far as having supervised contact in the contact centre as a final order or if he is lucky, contact may progress to having unsupervised contact in the community. However, what is almost certain is that by the time it comes to a final hearing, the final order is not going to resemble anywhere near the loving, appropriate contact full of opportunities and memories to build the bonds he was seeking at the start of the proceedings. Now over a year and a half ago. Well folks, it is time to start concluding this vlog. So let me begin to sum up my final thoughts. But very importantly, if anything that I have explained from my observations and experience resonates with you, then please contact me at contactphil.co.uk to find support. You are not alone. At the beginning, I made a statement that I believe that I have the knowledge and understanding of how to use the blueprint of hate to reduce, minimise, restrict or deny contact, which works almost every time. I witness this happening to varying degrees all the time, and I believe these tactics are endemic in the family courts up and down the country. I have no doubt that there are potentially thousands of fathers out there who will either in part or entirely relate to what I have described. And what is so terrifying 
is that there is almost no defence against the blueprints of hate. It is like a relentless pattern that very few judges are willing to challenge or change. The blueprint of hate works relentlessly in the family courts, severing relationships between children and their fathers and destroying childhoods. And no one in the cruel, broken, inept, incompetent and incomprehensible system challenges the mother. No one points a finger at the mother and says, you are the one significantly harming your children. You are the child abuser. I will never use this blueprint of hate and I will never assist a resident parent to wield spurious allegations of hate to destroy their ex and the children. However, I don't see family lawyers taking a similar stand. All too often I see them happily represent the truth of mothers, however spurious, nonsensical, irrelevant and disproportionate the allegations are. They hide behind their shield of following their client's instructions and operate with impunity in being implicit in the destruction of childhoods, having no professional duty of care to any child. What a sick, sick profession they are in. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand by everything that I say. What a terrifying family court system we have. Until next time, and to the non-resident parents, the mostly fathers, keep strong.